There is a point early in any Cold War documentary where the focus shifts away from diplomacy and weapon stockpiles and toward the question no strategist could escape. If deterrence failed, how would ordinary people survive the unthinkable? During those tense decades, governments around the world poured resources into a type of shelter that had to withstand blast waves, firestorms, fallout, and long-term isolation. The stakes were absolute. What emerged from that era was a shelter design so effective that even today, modern emergency planners still borrow from it. For the next minute, it's worth staying grounded in that reality. Cold War shelters were not nostalgia pieces. They were built through research, under the pressure of existential threat. What they solved, protection, insulation, self-sufficiency, remains just as relevant for survivalist homesteaders and preparedness enthusiasts today. Now, let's move straight into what made this design so effective why it remains unmatched, and how the principles behind it can be applied in practical ways right now. Cold War engineers understood survival as a layered system rather than a single structure. The most successful Cold War shelter designs were based on a philosophy that survival depended on layers. Layers of earth, layers of reinforced material, layers of airflow, and layers of redundancy. Governments realized that a shelter was not simply a bunker. It had to serve as a controlled environment capable of protecting life long after the initial threat had passed. This mindset produced the classic earth-covered, reinforced, low-profile fallout shelter that still outperforms modern prefabricated or lightweight designs. Engineers discovered that earth was the most abundant and reliable radiation shield available. Soil absorbs gamma radiation far more effectively than air or steel at comparable thicknesses. Covering a shelter with several feet of packed earth reduced radiation exposure to survivable levels even during peak fallout. Today, this principle is one of the most valuable takeaways for survivalists. If someone wants to strengthen an existing storm shelter or root cellar for long-term emergencies, simply berming the structure with packed soil or sandbags can drastically increase protection, often more effectively than attempting to install expensive commercial shielding panels. Ventilation became the hidden strength that made these shelters sustainable. Most people associate Cold War shelters with concrete and steel, but the true brilliance was in the airflow systems. Fallout shelters required filtered, passive, or manually powered ventilation to prevent both carbon dioxide buildup and overheating. Designers learned that shelters buried under earth stayed cool, but also trapped stale air dangerously fast. The solution was the Kearney air pump and other manually operated ventilation systems that could move large volumes of air with no electricity. This was more than mechanical design. It was a recognition that self-sufficiency meant operating under complete energy failure. A modern survivalist can apply this knowledge immediately by integrating at least two forms of passive airflow into any off-grid shelter. Warm air rises and exits through the high vent, pulling fresh air in through the low one. This centuries-old principle remains central to Cold War shelter design and is still used in many modern off-grid homes. One of the most underrated features of Cold War shelters was their shape. Engineers learned that a low-profile structure with a curved or arched ceiling 
distributed blast pressure better than flat roof designs. The classic barrel vault reinforced shelter became standard because it resisted both compression from earth cover and shock from distant blasts. Anyone building or retrofitting a shelter today can apply this concept. A curved roof, whether built from reinforced concrete, corrugated steel culvert pipe, or a simple arched form, naturally channels force downward into the walls instead of absorbing it directly. Even modern tornado shelters adopt this principle, not because of nuclear concern, but because curved structures withstand lateral pressure better than squared ones. Cold War shelters were also designed for long-term habitability rather than just short-term hiding. You see, a Cold War shelter wasn't meant to be a place to duck and cover for only a few hours. It had to support weeks of isolation. That meant, well, there needed to be cooking setups that produced minimal smoke, sanitation systems that avoided water contamination, waste management solutions, and food storage that could survive heat and moisture fluctuations. The practical survival lesson here is pretty straightforward. A shelter is only as good as its daily use systems. So, a modern preparedness enthusiast who builds a bunker-like space really must think beyond just walls and ceiling. For example, keeping a dedicated sealed container of high-dry matter foods like rice, beans and wheat in metal bins echoes that Cold War storage strategy and, importantly, prevents rodent access. Installing a simple composting toilet system with sawdust or peat moss, well, that replicates the sanitation solutions used in many mid-century civilian shelters. And adding a two-bucket water filtration setup using ceramic or carbon filters that mirrors the redundancy Cold War planners always insisted on. One reason these shelters outperform modern designs is that they were built on realism rather than optimism. These days, commercial survival shelters often prioritize comfort or aesthetics over actual resilience. The Cold War era had no such luxury at all. Threat assessments dictated function first, appearance last. Shelters were buried deep, reinforced with thick concrete, supplied with manual tools, and stripped of fragile systems. They were designed for people who might be underground for weeks without any external assistance. That raw practicality, well, it's why these shelters still outperform many sleek modern versions. Applying this today means, well, stripping survival planning back to its functional essentials. Instead of focusing on electronics or luxury systems, a better approach is to build around food, air, water, insulation and manual redundancy. You know, a simple hand-operated water pump or crank-powered ventilation fan can actually outperform an entire set of battery-driven systems during prolonged emergencies. Understanding this shelter design gives today's survivalists a framework for real resilience. The core lesson from Cold War shelter design is that protection must be passive, sustainable and dependable when everything else fails. Earth shielding, manual ventilation, curved geometry and pragmatic living systems formed the backbone of a design that still remarkably surpasses many modern alternatives. For anyone building or upgrading an existing shelter today, these principles offer a clear roadmap. Start with mass and coverage. Strengthen airflow. Design for weeks instead of hours. Avoid relying on electricity. Build for endurance rather than convenience. These steps Honestly, replicate the mindset 
that kept Cold War populations prepared during a time when the world balanced on a knife's edge. If this deep dive into Cold War engineering brought new insight and value, make sure to subscribe to In the Beginning. Share this video with fellow history engineering and survival enthusiasts so we can keep exploring the forgotten designs that still shape resilience today.